Hello, friends, and welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. And we are indeed going to take this hour and dedicate it to the Lord in worship. Worship Him, as the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. And we're going to worship Him just like that in song and in word today. We have a powerful message in which uh, I'm going to be declaring kind of a warning. It's a famine warning. The title of this message is A Famine is Coming. But before we get right into the message, we have our brother Tim Pardon who is going to sing for us the beautiful song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. His word will not fail you, he promised. Believe it and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. If you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus. Mm. Praise the Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. One of my favorite songs. And that's exactly kind of the theme, the motto of this message is as we're declaring a warning, a coming famine. We're going to be talking about what kind of famine in just a moment. But the answer to it, of course, is simple. A sermon in and of itself. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and everything will be okay. Let us pray before we get into our message right now. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, at this moment. As you have bestowed upon all of us the wonderful privilege of representing you, preaching the word of God for you, Lord, for the redemption of man. And so, Lord, as I break open the bread of life, as we attempt to rightly divide the word of truth, Lord, not, do not let it be uh, a man-made effort to do so. Lord, I'm praying right now in Jesus' name that you will bestow upon me and in me the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me to speak your word that this message will not only penetrate the hearts and minds of every person around the world listening, but also mine as well. We thank you for all that you have done and for who you are as our God. And we pray this in confidence and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A famine is coming. A famine is on its way. Perhaps one of the greatest phenomenons, at least from my perspective, one of the most interesting occurrences in the history of our nation and the history of this world happened back in March of 2020. <laughs> exactly. Not so far distant away from where we are now. Just March of 2020. You can read all the historical occurrences of this nation and of this world and one of the strangest, most interesting occurrences 
that happened in March of 2020, of course, was the very sudden, the very swift shutdown of the world due to the pandemic COVID-19. Of course, it will forever mark the year 2020 as probably one of the worst years that perhaps we've ever experienced uh, in our country and in recent times at least. It was almost as if everyone was living in peace for the most part, living as if everything was okay, everyone was safe, nothing was going to happen, and then boom, it was upon us. A pandemic that would forever change our society and rock the known world that we happen to live in. You know, the Bible gives us a couple of passages that provide some insight and somewhat of a prophetic uh, imagery toward this event and, of course, many others that will soon take place, I believe, as the Bible plainly tells us that it will. I want to start by going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Notice what the Bible says. And, of course, this is Paul writing. He says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The words found right here, of course, that really stand out to me is the concept of living in a state of peace and safety. Similar to what perhaps maybe society somewhat felt uh, prior to March 2020. Um, while the world, of course, we know is horrible and, and there's horrible things that happen in the world, for the most part, most Americans and most other citizens from other countries all around the world we're living in somewhat of a state of peace and safety. But then it's almost as if the pandemic that happened and occurred as it began to spread across the world began to cause a state of shock. It launched people into a state of fear. And within just a week and a half to two weeks, our world was changed probably permanently. I don't know that we'll ever see uh, or see a world that we once lived in. Uh, this probably has forever marked uh, this, this historical event will for sure be marked in history uh, as a life-changing scenario. But nearly 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote, as he was given inspiration by the Holy Spirit, that when they say peace and safety... Everything's okay. Life's going on just fine and dandy. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall, in the Greek, it says, no, not escape. Of course, it begs to mention that we also, I believe, have been living in a state of peace and safety. And while some people consider the pandemic to be a disruption to our way of life and to society and to the world as we knew it, uh, my friends, I'm here to tell you that I believe that was a very small, minuscule occurrence compared to what is coming in the near future. Notice also in Luke chapter 17, this is another passage. Luke 17, verses 26 and 27 uh, and also verses 28 and 29 in Luke chapter 17. It maps out for us also in a similar uh, scenario, exactly what we've been talking about so far, uh, people living in a state of what may be the Bible, as the Bible clearly says, peace and safety, uh, a state of, 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 of never-ending bliss, I guess you could say. Everything's okay. We're just going to live out our life. And then all of a sudden, Destruction comes that, of course, would disrupt their known reality. Notice Luke chapter 17. We've all read the passage many times. Beginning in verse 26 and 27, the Bible says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 
Now I'm going to continue on reading verse 28 and 29, and we're going to come back and just mark something interesting here. Verse 28 continues to say, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, I find this passage interesting because, again, it communicates that same theme that we're talking about. Living in that state of peace and safety. Everything's okay. Everything's going to be all right. Almost in some cases, it's living on as if there is no God and, and that Bible prophecy is of no avail. That it's not really that important because everything is just going to be okay. But it's interesting right here that the language and the communication, the, the literary devices that are used from the author, in this case, Luke, as he uses some language to clearly communicate this uh, and emphasize it very clearly. For instance, if you go back to verse 27 where it says that they ate and they drank and they, notice it, and they married wives and, of course, they were also given in marriage. Well, in the original Greek, the words they're used actually communicates a sense of almost like nyanya words, like kind of and a, a passive, like, oh, they were doing this and they were doing that. For instance, if you listen to the words, they were estio and they were pio and they were escamadizo. And so it's kind of like this blah, da, da. And then, boom, sun destruction came and the flood came and it, wash them all away, right? It destroyed them all. Same thing, same language used, same concept communicated in verses 28 and 29, where it says, likewise, it was also in the days of Lot. They did, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. The Greek, they ethizo, they pio, they are, they agordazo, they fatuo. I know these are Greek words, but still, it's, it, notice the common theme. It's kind of this nya nya, kind of like, oh, they were doing this and they were doing that. And life was just going on as just so blissfully peaceful and everything's okay. And then all of a sudden, there came up on Lot and his family. And of course, we know they were saved uh, uh, with the exception, of course, of his wife. But they were taken out of the city in which upon that city fell fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You see, in the last days, Bible prophecy tells us that there will come a time very soon where destruction will come upon this earth. And many of us have been told this. We've been warned about it. We've heard about it. We preach about it. We teach about it. But of course, some of us are not as prepared as others because we're living in a state of peace and safety. But the Bible says that then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall no not escape. You see, Paul continues on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And he talks about how not only the world will be affected by this coming destruction or this, 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 uh, uh, this horrible work that will be going on in society that will bring about the end time events. He talks about how it will directly affect the church and how people within the church will respond to this not in a positive way, but in a very negative way. Notice, again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, part of verse 3, because there's a point that I want to emphasize here for the message. Paul starts by saying, Now, brethren, again, we've got to, keep, we got to, we got to memorize and, and be, be remi reminded that he's writing this to the church at Thessalonica. So his audience is not non-believers. It's church members. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering unto him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Okay, so pause there for a moment and let's get this in our mind. He just said not to be soon shaken. That doesn't mean that the church is not going to experience a shaking. That doesn't mean that there's not going to come some type of trouble upon the world that will soon obviously bring some type of discomfort to those perhaps in the church. 
But he says, for these particular brothers and sisters, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, of course, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it's coming from us, right? As though the day of Christ has come or had come. He's saying, look, you don't have to worry about that just yet. He says, why? I'm going to tell you why, Paul says. I'm going to tell you how you will know when the day of the Lord is near or when the coming of the Son of Man is coming. He tells us in verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. It says, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, speaking of the second coming of Jesus, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Did you catch that? That day, the second coming of Jesus, the return of Christ, will not come upon this world until a great falling away occurs. Now, again, not trying to be over theological here, but just a kind of a, a surface blanket interpretation and understanding of this text does not provide the fullest understanding of what Paul is talking about. Sometimes you got to, as the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. Sometimes you got to go below the surface and dig a little deeper. And that's why sometimes we have to do a little bit of a word search, some deeper word study. And when I looked up this falling away, what is the great falling away that he's talking about? What does it mean that before Christ come, there's going to be a great falling away? Well, the word that he uses here is the Greek word apostasia. The Greek word apostasia, it's where we get, of course, our English word apostasy. And of course, many people have a different understanding of what apostasy is, or some people may have this particular definition of what apostasy is, and someone else may uh, somewhat have a, their own personal uh, perspective of what apostasy is. But yet right here in the original Greek, the word apostasia, the meaning of it means to defect from truth to divorce. Now keep in mind, Paul is writing this to the church. Why is he writing this warning to the church? Because Paul has already reminded us, as we just read there in 1 Thessalonians, and we also saw the imagery there in Luke 17, similar to the days of Noah, similar to the days of Lot, so shall it be at the end time before Christ comes back. We see this Paul, Jesus, the apostles, all of the Bible writers, they warn us, they, they, they're telling us, they're shouting, they're raising the banner high and saying, look, there's coming a time and it will affect the church. Church. In this case, this great apostasia, this great defection from truth, this great divorcing, that's right, divorcing, he's telling and warning the people of the church because, my friends, before Christ comes back, the state of the church, the condition of the church in many people's understanding, in many people's eyes, will not look so great. Because it's not called just a falling away. It's called the great falling away. It's great. It's, it's, it's huge. And so the great falling away, this apostasia, this great apostasy, it simply means that people deceived into believing that they know Jesus will actually fall away from Jesus. While they are convinced that they are bound to and married to the truth, they're actually going to abandon the truth. And of course, the word here that really sticks out to me is divorce. To divorce. And it's interesting that we know that he's writing this to the church and not just to... Of course, this message goes to everyone, but specifically the church, because you cannot divorce yourself from someone whom you weren't married to. And so this is somewhat of a prophecy, of course. Very clearly a prophecy where Paul is saying that there will be people prior to the second coming of Jesus that believe that they are 100% devoted and married to Jesus Christ, but yet they have divorced themselves from Him. What a condition. What a condition. In fact, we don't even have to wor wonder as to what kind of condition or what this condition looks like, because by the time you get over to Revelation chapter 3, Jesus Himself spells it out. He tells us very clearly in Revelation chapter 3, speaking to the very last church age, Laodicea, he says these words. 
I know your works, that you neither are hot or cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will, and this is a strong word, I will vomit you as the New King James Version says. Uh, King James Version says spew you. But again, the same word here in the Greek could mean spew or vomit or regurgitate. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Of course, that passage is found in Revelation 3, verses 14 through 17. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, Jesus says. As to that last church age, you think that you know me, but you don't. You think that you have accepted and are living according to the truth, but you're not. Of course, you believe that you're married to me, but yet you don't realize because of your deception, because of your self-denial uh, in the sense of uh, your, 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 your deceiving denial, you have divorced yourself from me. That's what Jesus is saying right here. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but you are lukewarm. Now, I found a rather interesting and eye-opening commentary on these verses in reference of being cold and, you know, cold or hot, lukewarm, the condition of the church lukewarmness, this Laodicean state. This comes from, uh, looking in here, it's, it's July 26, 1874, written by Charles Spurgeon. Notice how he describes this. This is quite lengthy, but I want you to, I want you to hear the words, the detailed words that he describes, which I think is spot on as to what Jesus is talking about in reference to this lukewarm condition of the church prior to the second coming of Jesus. And this is what Charles Spurgeon says. The condition described in our text is secondly, one of mournful indifference and carelessness. They were not cold, but they were not hot. They were not infidels, yet they were not earnest believers that they did not oppose. Notice that they did not oppose the gospel, neither did they defend it. They were not working mischief, neither were they doing any great good. They were not disreputable in moral character, but they were not distinguished for holiness. He says, they were not irreligious, but they were not enthusiastic in piety, nor eminent for zeal. They were what the world calls moderates. They were of the broad church school. They were neither bigots nor Puritans. They were prudent and avoided fanaticism, respectable and adverse to excitement. Good things were maintained among them, but they did not make too much of them. They had prayer meetings, but there were few in present. For they liked quiet evenings at home. When more attended the meetings, they were still very dull. For they did not, notice, for they did their praying very deliberately and were afraid of being too excited. They were content to have all things done decently and in order. But vigor and zeal they consider to be vulgar. Notice how he continues. Such churches have schools, Bible classes, preaching rooms, and all sorts of agencies. But they might as well be without them. For no energy is displayed and no good comes of them. They have deacons and elders who are excellent pillars of the church. That's if the chief quality of pillars is to stand still and exhibit no emotion or motion. They have their ministers who may be the angels of the churches. But if so, they have their wings closely clipped for they do not fly very far in preaching the everlasting gospel, and they certainly are not flames of fire. They may be shining lights of eloquence, but they are certainly not burning lights of grace, setting men's hearts on fire. Last paragraph. Listen to these words. In such communities, everything is done in a half-hearted, listless, dead and alive way as if it did not matter much whether it was done or not. It makes one's flesh creep to see how sluggishly they move. 
And he says these words. He says, I long for a knife to cut their red tape to pieces and for a whip to lay about their shoulders to make them bestir themselves. Things are respectably done. The rich families are not offended. The skeptical party is conciliated and the good people are not quite alienated. Things are made pleasant all around. The right things are done, but as to doing them with all your might, soul, and strength, a Laodicean church has no notion of what that means. They are not so cold as to abandon their work or to give up their meetings for prayer or to reject the gospel. If they did so, he says, then they could be convinced of their error and brought to repentance. But on the other hand, they are neither hot for the truth nor hot for conversions, nor hot for holiness. They are not fiery enough to burn the stubble of sin, nor zealous enough to make Satan angry, nor fervent enough to make a living sacrifice of themselves upon the altar of their God. He says they are neither cold nor hot. Mm. Probably the best description of what it means to be Laodicean, coming from Charles Spurgeon. You know, Mrs. Ellen White actually echoes this very same concept in the first volume of the Testimonies, page 179 to 181. So you can go there, first volume of the Testimonies, page 179 to 181. And uh, I'm going to read a couple of quotes here just to kind of provide some, some, uh, some backup, some foundation again for what it is we're talking about here. But notice on the same thing that Spurgeon was speaking, same theme as what Jesus was speaking in Laodicea, This is what she says about the condition of the church in the last days prior to the second coming of Jesus. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. Of course, she's referring to a great shaking that she saw that would occur among God's people, the church in the last days. She says that she saw that some of them were not participating in the prayerful agonizing and, of course, uh, seeking after Jesus on a daily basis. So she goes on to say, they, speaking of those who are in the church, but again, are not seeking after and pleading for the Holy Spirit to work in them. She says, they seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these. And she, of course, this is a vision she saw. So she says, and I saw them, uh, she said, the angel of God left these and I saw them hastening to the assistance of those who were struggling with all their energies to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. In this vision she received, which she recorded in the first volume of the Testimonies, she makes it very clear that she saw them. They were indifferent and careless. That's Laodicean. That's exactly what Paul was talking about. The great falling away. People who believe they're married to Jesus, but they're not. They believe they've accepted the truth and living by the truth, but they're not. This is the condition. And of course, it sets us up for a great coming famine. And we're going to see about what this famine is in just a moment. I want to read another quote here. This is from Early Writings. Page 54 and 56. Of course, this is uh, in reference to another vision that she had received about the heavenly throne room of God, Jesus and the Father sitting on the throne, and then they get up, they leave the holy place and go into the most holy place. But notice what she says she saw here. She says, before the throne, I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. I saw two companies. One bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood, notice the words, uninterested and careless. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he rose. And they were left in perfect darkness. And I have to ask a question. How does the, how does the church get to that 
condition. Now, I want to clarify something. When I say the church, of course, we're not talking about everyone in the church, right? The church is a body, and there just happens to be wheat and tares in that body. But of course, how do people in the church come to this condition? How do they arrive at this condition? Of course, there's multiple texts and multiple passages that I could reference uh, about this. But there's one particular text that comes to mind when answering that question. How in the world do people reach this state of apostasy, this state of defecting from truth, divorcing themselves from Jesus, in which they will be caught up in this great famine that is coming? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus gives us the solution. But notice what the solution includes. It says that he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So how does a person, anyone in the church, arrive to this careless, indifferent, complacent condition of Laodicea? Lukewarmness. How does it happen? Well, it happens because people abandon their daily, genuine Christian walk with Christ. They abandon their daily looking unto Christ and having a genuine spirit-filled experience with Him. Notice how I keep saying daily, because what did Christ say? Let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. You see, you got a lot of people, my friends, a lot of Christians, professed Christians in the church who are not having that daily communion experience with Christ. They profess Him, as Jesus says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Many of us find ourselves in that condition. Some of us can't see it because we're deceived. Deceived into believing that we know Jesus when we do not. Deceived into believing that we're going to go to heaven when in, when in reality, if we don't shape up, examine ourselves and allow Jesus to cleanse us from the inside out, we won't be seeing the kingdom of God, as Jesus said. Paul wrote of this daily experience, this great righteousness by faith experience. He referred to it using the words from faith to faith, day by day, glory to glory. You see, the righteousness by faith experience is a daily ongoing experience with Jesus. And the condition of Laodicea exists, this falling away apostasy experience exists for many because they are not having a genuine step-by-step, day-by-day Faith to faith, glory to glory moment with Jesus. You see, what Paul is describing in his letters when he writes about this righteousness by faith experience and, and, and coming to know Christ and, 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 and Him washing you and cleansing you daily from your sins, you see, that is a process. We know it's a lifelong process of sanctification, but it's a never-ending, ongoing process. And some people, well, truth is, they have hit the pause button on their righteousness by faith journey. We reach a point that for whatever reason, we become distracted, we become complacent, we become comfortable in our peace and safety environment, and we stop seeking and looking and searching for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, many of us hear this language, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith experience. And sometimes we really can't fully grasp, what is that? What, is it, what does that mean? And Ryan, what do you mean by people have pressed the pause button on their righteousness by faith experience? Well, I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 5 here. I want to spell this out for you very clearly. Probably in no other passage of Scripture is it more clear, uh, clearly mapped out, I guess you could say. As it, did Christ make it more clear uh, other than Matthew chapter 5 here in, the, in the, uh, what we call the Beatitudes? 
Now, many people read the Beatitudes and they see them as these kind of individual bullet point, you know, just kind of like, you know, blessed is this kind of person and blessed is this kind of person. And, oh, these kind of people will be blessed. But really what Christ is doing in the Beatitudes is he's mapping out. He's showing you a step by step, you know, one level of Christian character development to the next kind of experience uh, that we call righteousness by faith. So why don't we go there? Matthew chapter five. I want to show you this very clearly in the Bible. We're going to read through these Beatitudes and I'm going to show you how they're all interconnected. Jesus is spelling out. He's he's illustrating out. He's, He's clearly putting it on display as to what this righteousness by faith experience must be if you're going to make sure that you're not caught up in the great falling away and find yourself in trouble during the coming famine the coming famine. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. Of course, Jesus is speaking, and he gives us that first great beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you can go through and read these. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are... And so again, we almost look at it almost in a poetic sense. Like Jesus is just like, ah, blessed are these kind of people. And... Blessed are those kind of people over there. Oh, these kind of people will be blessed. But my friends, notice Jesus is actually taking us through the righteousness by faith experience. So somebody has pressed the pause button along this journey. You don't want to press that pause button. You want to make sure that you continue on this journey because Jesus wants you to have a genuine experience with him. So what does Jesus say right off the cuff? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. What does Jesus mean by this? What does he mean, blessed are the poor in spirit? Again, when the Pharisees heard this, you could just imagine their their mouths flew open, you know, and (gasps) what what, what did he just say? Whoa, you know, (laughs) because all they probably heard was blessed are the poor. (laughs) Because back in their day, if you were poor and you weren't rich, you were cursed, right? You were cursed by God. If you were rich and you were an abundance of worldly goods, well, then you must be blessed by God because he's given you all these wonderful things and he's prospered you. And so I'm sure probably the Pharisees off to the side, they're hearing Jesus, you know, say these words and they're just, oh, what? He just said, blessed are the poor. But that's not what he said. He didn't say blessed are the poor. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. What in the world does that mean? You see, Jesus is giving us the very first step that we must experience in order to have a genuine experience with Him. When He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, what He's saying is, blessed are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. Blessed are you when you come to the point in your life where you realize you have hit rock bottom and there's nothing else for you to give. Blessed are you when you come to the realization that you see your condition and you recognize that you are spiritually bankrupt and that only Jesus Christ, the Savior, can get you out. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then notice the next beatitude. He says in verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Interesting. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So people who are mourning, you know, they're blessed, right? Well, some people would probably disagree with that. Well, when they're mourning, they probably don't feel very blessed. But it's in connection to the previous beatitude. You see, the natural response When you realize, once you realize your spiritual depravity, you will mourn, but yet you'll be comforted. You see, when you realize that your sins nailed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to a cross, that because of your sins, He had to die. When when you really comprehend that and that settles into your mind, it brings about a natural response. In fact, it's talked about in Zechariah chapter 12, I believe it is, where he makes it very, very clear that they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn. 
That's the natural response. Jesus, you died for me. I deserved that death. I deserve to die on a cross. Not you. You're perfect. You're wonderful. You've never sinned. You don't deserve my punishment. But Jesus did it out of love. And when you comprehend that, you will mourn. But yet, you'll be comforted. Notice the next beatitude, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Hmm. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, this is in connection to the previous two. You see, after you're broken by the love of Jesus, you adopt an attitude of meekness. That's right. Which brings us to our next beatitude. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Notice how this is Jesus taking you from one level of Christian character development to the next. So before you became meek because you were broken by the love of Jesus. And you adopted an attitude of meekness. So, when you adopt an attitude of meekness, true, genuine, Christ-like meekness, you begin to hunger and thirst for His righteousness. That's powerful. Jesus is taking it. He's mapping it out. And then, of course, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You see... There's a difference between human mercy and godly mercy. You see, once you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful. That's just the natural response. Jesus is shaping and molding you into the person that he wants you to be, that vessel of honor for his kingdom. So when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you begin to receive His righteousness on your behalf. And when you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful. But it's not just any old kind of mercy. We're going to see what that is in just a moment. Let's go to the next beatitude because it's in connection. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. So how does that connect to the previous one? Very simple. Once you are merciful, true godly mercy, once you are merciful, and here it is, true godly mercy, and begin to treat others the way God treats us, then and only then, you become pure in heart. Now, will you ever feel that way? I don't think any of us are going to you know, wake up one day and be like, oh man, I just... I just feel so pure in heart today. I just feel so perfect. None of us are going to feel that way. Because when you look at Christ's righteousness and you see your own, you kind of have that Isaiah experience. Woe is me, right? For I am undone. I am a sinful man. Oh, woe is me, right? I'm the chief of sinners. That's how, that's how Paul uh, made it out. He said, I feel like the chief of sinners. But yet God sees you. He sees that when you begin to show true godly mercy, you begin to treat others the way He treats us, then through His eyes, you are pure in heart. <sighs> but it doesn't stop there. Notice verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now what in the world does that have to do with the previous Beatitudes? Again, we're on a journey. Christ is changing us. So here it is. Once you are pure in heart, you begin to live and share the message of the Prince of Peace. Christ is taking you on a journey from one level of Christian character development to the next. You're pure in heart. You've received the peace of God in your life. You have accepted the Prince of Peace's righteousness. And so now you begin to live out and share that message of peace, the message of Jesus with others. 
You don't do it because you're prompted to. You don't do it because you tell yourself, well, I'm, I'm a Christian and that's what I'm supposed to do. You see, it's a natural response. It's kind of like when someone burns their finger or burns their hand in a hot fire. They don't leave it there and go, oh, that burns. That's hot. There's a natural response to pull back and to, because you've been hurt. I know that's probably not the greatest illustration, <laughs> but nonetheless, in a, in a positive sense, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a true, genuine, daily experience with Christ, the natural response of living out and declaring the message of the Prince of Peace is that you just got to do it. It's a part of your life. It's a, it's a lifestyle now. Because God has bestowed His love upon you, you can't help to tell people about it and about Him. Which leads us to the last beatitude of this section. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wait, wait, wait a second, Jesus. <laughs> you're supposed to end on a good note. <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to end with something positive, Jesus. See, we, we're kind of in that mind frame where everything is kind of, kind of, kind of lead to this big happy ending. And, and in reality, this is a happy ending, but the words don't necessarily resonate well with us. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus, you're telling me that, that I'm going to be persecuted? What? That's what you're leading me to? Well, it's not in God's plan for you to be persecuted. But nonetheless, there's an enemy. And as long as that enemy exists, the kingdom agenda of God flies in the face of the dark agenda of the enemy. You see, once you are living, genuinely living and sharing the message of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, you will receive persecution. Not you might, you know, not that you could, you will. That's why Jesus says, you shall, those who, those who receive him shall be persecuted for his name's sake. Now, some of us, we don't really know what it means to be persecuted. And many of us, of all of that that we just read through, again, let me read through these really quickly here so you get it. You see, blessed are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. It starts there. And then once you realize your spiritual depravity, that you're bankrupt, you see, you're going to mourn because you recognize that Jesus has bestowed his love upon you. He wants to change you. He has taken your penalty. And therefore, you'll mourn but he's going to come sweep you up and he's going to comfort you. After being broken by the love of God, you adopt an attitude of meekness. And of course, when you adopt an attitude of meekness, you hunger and thirst for righteousness. The next one, once you accept the righteousness of Christ in your life, you become merciful, true godly mercy. And of course, once you are merciful and begin to, uh, to treat others the way God treats us, then you become pure in heart. And then once you are pure in heart, you begin to live and share the message of the Prince of Peace. And then of course, once you are living and sharing the message of the Prince of Peace, you will receive persecution. Why doesn't it seem like there's more persecution in the church today? That's an interesting thought. Now, you may be watching and saying, well, Ron, I'm persecuted all the time. Only you and God truly know if that's the case. But it just doesn't seem like there's much persecution today. I want to read you a quote from Great Controversy, page 48. Listen to this quote. So she asks a question. She says, why is it then? that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber. She says, the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. 
The religion which is current in our day is not, the pure and ho- not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be, she says, notice, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Mm. Why is there no persecution? Because we have people that are not living out and declaring the message of the Prince of Peace. We have people that have pressed the pause button somewhere along that journey. Perhaps maybe they've accepted Jesus. Maybe they've had that mournful experience, but somewhere along the way they failed to become meek. They failed to become humble. They failed to become merciful. Perhaps they're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Again, that daily righteousness by faith experience, my friends. You see, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 gives us some insight of what the natural response is of a person who is genuinely led by the Holy Spirit of God. If you are genuinely led by the Holy Spirit of God, there's a natural response. There's an automatic response. Notice what it says, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. I'm going to read a portion of it, and here's what it says. And then, of course, this, this message comes from Jesus. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You see, when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, my friends, we, we want, we desire, we need to become a witness for Christ because you're being led by the true, genuine Spirit of God. But many of us, my friends, have mercy. We're quenching the Holy Spirit. We're no longer listening to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're going our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. The work cannot be finished and we cannot go home until the church wakes up. But there's a famine coming. And because of the current condition, many of us are not ready for the famine. Have you heard the story about the four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody? Let me tell you that story. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about this because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. That right there sums up the condition for most Christians today. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives to not only just wake us up, but to give us the power to declare the truth of God's word, to live it out among the world so that we can prepare for the coming famine. Now, I've talked about a famine. <laughs> you see, what we need in our, in our time, what we need today is more Josephs. Did Joseph experience a famine in his day? Now, I told you there's a famine coming And I believe that there is. And I'm going to tell you about that famine right now in our closing minutes. Everything we've been talking about leads up to this and is connected to this. If you think 2020 was bad, my friends, if we're not rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, I don't know that we're prepared for what is coming. You see, we need some Josephs. You see, there's a little something we can learn from Joseph. Joseph experienced some things. You see, he had some brothers And of course, Joseph and his brothers had the same father, but different mothers. (laughs) Did you catch that? Joseph and his brothers had the same father, but different mothers. Just like us, right? We all worship the same God, but some of us, well, we're kind of, we're we're on our own spiritual journey that may not necessarily be in connection with the father. 
You see, the 11, Joseph had 11 brothers. The 11 did not like Joseph. Why? Because he kept the commandments of his father and had the gift of prophecy. And of course, he was persecuted for his faith, just like many of us will be persecuted for our faith. So he ends up in Egypt, right? Persecuted, sent to Egypt, the Mecca of false worship of his day. And while he's there, he's tempted, get this, he's tempted by a harlot. And he's thrown into prison. But because he had the spirit of prophecy, he was able to interpret a dream by Pharaoh. What was Pharaoh's dream? Listen to this, my friends. Remember the seven, cat, the seven fat cattle and the seven scrawny, you know, sickly cattle? And it ate up the fat cattle. Same thing with the ears of corn, seven healthy ears of corn. Seven, that represented seven years of famine. What did Joseph tell? He foretold there was a famine coming, but how did he tell the people to prepare for that famine? See, many of us, we need to receive this counsel. We are told that there's a famine coming. You see, Joseph told his people to prepare for the famine during that seven years of plenty to gather grain. Now, what did they do with the grain? They made bread. You see, we need to be gathering bread. If we're going to make it through this coming famine, in fact, Amos chapter 8, verse 11 reminds us of this famine. Behold, the days are coming. Here it is. Says the Lord God that I will send a famine upon the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a hearing of the word of the Lord. My friends, a famine is coming. And Laodicea ain't ready for it. We got to get our hearts right today, my friends. Jesus is, in, is coming soon. And so I echo the words found in the first volume of the man, or first manuscript from 1890 when Ellen White screamed. I could just hear her screaming in loving agony, God of heaven, wake us up. That should be our prayer today. And my final appeal to you today, my friends, is pray that prayer. God of heaven, wake me up. Wake me from my Laodicean slumber. Help me to receive this time in which I'm living to prepare bread and to seek the Lord in his word to prepare my heart for what is coming. That should be our prayer. In fact, let's pray that in closing. Father in heaven, wake us up, Lord. Give us your Holy Spirit. Prepare us for the famine that is coming. That is what we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.